I have a lot of heartfelt thanks for the Chinese people. And my father always impressed upon me that without the Chinese people, I would not be here. It was their generosity and bravery which got him through the, through the lines initially. What this is from Wai Chow to Rangoon and home, and it's based on the naval party on their way to, over to mainland China. They're now using their best transport possible to get to Wai Chow. Uh, led by Admiral Chan Chak after escaping from the clutches of the Japanese in Hong Kong, and with the exceptional bravery and assistance of the Chinese people. The threat of capture by patrolling Japanese forces and subjected to bitter cold and hunger, the escape party took refuge by day in fields and temples before trekking the mountainous terrain by night. The ragged party finally cleared the Japanese lines and arrived at Wai Cha, with Chinese forces lining the approach in a salute to the men. Mark the occasion, the party was assembled outside the old mission building and the celebrated Wai Chao photo was taken. Chan Chak negotiated with some uh, guerrillas uh, to act as guides and assist them in getting getting through the Japanese lines and I believe they breached the Japanese lines on more than one occasion. This was a, a, a chap I met in China on the uh, beginning of last year. He is, I believe, the last surviving member of the East River guerrillas. His name was Li Bo, a man of great character. This is the escape map. So as you can see, from Hong Kong, the naval party, and the uh, military officers and the information officers got over to mainland China. The naval party carried on right to Rangoon, which was about 3,000 miles. Uh, this is a picture of my father, who was on the escape with the, uh, the guerrilla command. After two, two days rest at an ex-American hospital, the 68 escapees and some Chinese regular troops departed for Hong Kong by boat. Cool call. Just testing. <laughs> <laughs> They were uh, given two charcoal burning motor houseboats, known as Walla Wallas, by the locals and towing two 70 foot sampans. Three of the SOE agents returned to Nano to retrieve the heavy weapons left behind after scuttling the MTBs. They were not able to find any heavy weapons. I think the local Chinese had them. The guerrillas returned to the south of China to continue their operations against the Japanese. The guerrilla commander remains with the escape party acting as a guide. The Walla Wallas were open-ended and the escapees suffered uh, bitter winter temperatures and winds. The boats were very crowded and due to constant breakdowns, the troops, uh, all the troops had to transfer to the MHBs and abandon the sandbanks. Continuing on progress was very slow due to the many sandbanks. Some of the party exercised themselves by walking. The following morning they arrived in Luzing where a welcome was put on for Chan Chak. Entering Lu Chong and the TB crews were welcomed into the town to a firecracker and dog display. Welcome speeches were made and special dispensation had been made to slaughter a cow. After five days of river transport, the party travelling on a meagre diet of two small bowls of rice per day, they were met by Colonel Harry Owen Hughes. He arrived in China on the last plane out of Hong Kong. Harry Owen Hughes was liaison officer to General Yu Han Mo. Hughes was charged with arranging transport through southern China. He also had much needed funds, which meant they were not having to rely on the generosity of the Chinese people. Owen Hughes also provided much needed Chinese army padded jackets and blankets, which the escape party were most thankful for as it was winter. They departed Langchong at 6 a.m. in five trucks to take the escape party through the Nan Mountains to Kukong. Despite many breakdowns and running out of fuel, they arrived for coffee and biscuits at the Merry Knoll Mission in Gunsing. 6th of January, setting off in the early hours of 4.30 a.m., they arrived in, in Lunxing for a half-hour breakfast stop. During this part of the journey, they passed the Chinese army returning to Kukong. The Chinese army was miles and miles and miles long. Some trucks were able to stop at Nanhai, a Buddhist temple, where there were three mummies, one of which was Lok Tzu, the sixth reincarnation of Buddy, approximately 1,200 years old. The abbot there was 94 years old, who was restoring the temple. On the approach to Kukong, the, group, the, the party was met by a group of young ladies who pinned rosettes to their lapels, which provided the escape party the freedom of the city. 
this was a photograph of one of them being pinned on. The one on the left is my father's rosette. The escape party gave a ceremonial entry into Kukong where they stayed for a week. Quarters was a very impressive sampan called the Sea Palace, which was normally a flower boat. They remained in Kukong where they were fated by the local Chinese peoples. Admiral Chan Chak had the photo plate of the famous Wai Chao photograph and gave each of the escape party a copy. Admiral Chan Chak departed Kukong to have the bullet removed from his wrist and was not seen by the escape party again. This is just some photographs of Ku Kong, and I should say they're from Admiral Chan Chak's collection. In this you can see how respectful they, they are to him, and you can see that he was very much admired. They went on, uh, the Methodist mission there provided high tea, and it was the first Western foods they'd had since leaving Hong Kong. 14th of January, they were provided with typhoid treatment. Senior staff and intelligence officers parted for Chungking. And now we're, what we're doing is continuing with the naval members of the party. This guy here is was Lieutenant Commander Gandhi, and he was the uh, leader of the uh, MTB squadrons. And this was uh, the, some naval officers entertaining some Chinese nurses. 16th of January, they departed by train for Lu Chao, the capital of Anyal province. The railway company laid on a special supper in the waiting room which was decorated with allied flags. The party moved on Kuei Lin. As they approached Kuei Lin, this was an, there was an air raid warning in progress. They stayed long enough to visit the Seven Star Cave before embarking for Lu Chao. My dad said the Seven Star Cave was something to see. It was uh, extraordinary. Uh, this was a letter written to my father's uh, mother saying that he was missing, believed, killed in action. In Lo Chao, they hired four trucks at a cost of $80,000, and this was borrowed from the adju adjutant general of the 4th Chinese Army. After a two-day journey, they arrived in Gaiyang. Fine rain made the, most treacherous, made the roads treacherous, with drops of thousands of feet on, the, on either side many S-bends and no safety barriers. There was a lot of traffic with lines of Shetland-like ponies with bells attached to the road. 4 p.m. the Rod Red Cross put on a cinema show and this was followed by the naval party putting on a show which brought hoots of laughter for the locals, the local Chinese. They also supplied ambulances to take them to Kunming, which is the Chinese end of the Burma Road. The escape party was given the freedom of the city after a speech by General Wu. Each member was given a card showing the primitive life of Chinese tribes and it also had the governor's seal and that's a group of officers with some uh, young ladies at Kui Yang. There you can see what the roads are like um, with the drops. The trucks arrived at Kui Yang. Unfortunately, the tr Chinese drivers had a habit of switching off the engines to save fuel. Uh, overturned 50 miles from Kui Yang, three men suffered broken bones. Arrived at Kunming in the Wuling Mound, put up in a travel hostel with Australian commandos of the 204th Military Mission. It was here that they first saw their friendly fighter aircraft who were protecting the Burma Road. The 204th Military Mission was quite famous. It, it was designed to train um, Chinese people in guerrilla tactics and fighting Chinese. Ahead of them lay 684 miles or 1,100 kilometers of the famous Burma Road. This is a photograph of the Burma Road uh, as taken by a, an American reconnaissance plane. It's the beginning of the uh, Burma Road, uh, the Chinese. End. After 100, 120 miles, they arrived at Tonying, where they were housed with Australian, Australian commandos again, who were heading into China. Some of the views were breathtaking, but it was a seven-day night. The road was barely wide enough for traffic to pass. With two, uh, got a stutter there, thousands of feet drop. Impossible to travel after dark, approximately a smash truck every two miles. It was now 700 miles to Lashio, stopping at Chuxiong and, I can't say that one, for truck repairs. The hospitality of the Chinese people was wonderful. Passing through the poorest parts, they gave the best they could. Usually boiled rice, no milk or sugar. They came very adept at using chopsticks. The party arrived at the border town of Wontong and crossed into Burma, cele celebrating their first night on British sovereign soil. These are the trucks that they hired from Dodwell and Sons, and this guy, who's uh, Lieutenant Ashby, used to work for them. They waited five days for orders. The new part of town was out of bounds due to bubonic plague. 
Leaving Lashio, they arrived the following morning at Mayamo and then 45 miles trucked to Mandalay. Here they boarded a train to Rangoon, arriving on the 14th. Rangoon was deserted. They had now travelled 3,182 miles. They remained, remained in Rangoon for five weeks doing special duties, including stopping looters. One night they caught 50 Burmese with a Japanese officer landing. They were all shot. The escape party departed Rangoon on the SS Heinrich Jensen and returned three times. The last time was to blow up the go-downs, jetties, wireless station and all military places. Proceeding downstream, they stopped to blow up the oil refineries, which could see, be seen 40 miles out at sea. Just a picture of one of the, the Heinrich Jensen. It's just uh, rather peculiar that it was built by the Japanese. They went across to, uh, to Calcutta and then to Bombay and then Durban, Cape Town, Freetown. Arriving in Calcutta on the 12th, they departed on the 24th on a 36-hour train journey to Bombay, leaving Bombay on March 26 on the Nekunda, along with survivors of the battle cruisers Repulse and Prince of Wales, which had been sunk just off Singapore. After leaving Freetown, they were required to remain fully dressed as they entered the North Atlantic. They were zigzagging to avoid wolf packs, and they arrived at King George V Dock, Glasgow. Three officers and 27 ratings were all that remained of the 68 of the original escape party. Others remained in China and were repatriated by other means. Appreciation to the following, without these people I would not have been able to put this together, is my brother Richard Hyde for his website and photos, Vaughan Ashby for his photos and access to his diary, Donald Chan for photos, and Nigel Collingwood for photos. I'd also like to give a special thanks to William for translating. Buddy Hyde returned home to the UK. Within weeks, he was again deployed to the Far East. He retired from the Navy in 1955 and emigrated with his family to Tanganyika, Africa. David Hyde was awarded the Australian National Medal in February 1999 in recognition for his services to his adopted country.